The first time I ever handled 35 millimeter motion picture film was in the summer of 1964. The older brother of a friend of mine had been working on a film in Los Angeles, and he had brought back with him to the East Coast as a souvenir a short end of black and white negative raw stock. The short end is a length of unexposed film at the end of a camera load that's too short to be used, so it's removed from the magazine and usually discarded. I remember how moved I was at being able to handle this roll of film. In the time since then, I've worked around 35 millimeter on and off. I've never seen a piece of 35 that I didn't want to pick up and look at, and sometimes I've been free to keep pieces that I've come across. In the summer of 1968, a friend of mine was working for the company that was going to distribute La Chinoise in this country. He spoke French, so he was given the job of preparing the English subtitles. I was in New York when the first subtitled print was ready, and my friend invited me to attend its first showing. The film had come back from the subtitling place on 1,000 foot reels, which in 35 are only about 10 minutes long. To avoid having a lot of changeovers, the projectionist consolidated the 1,000 foot reels into 2,000 foot reels, the standard size for the projection of feature films. So we had to cut off some of the head and tail leaders, which he then discarded. Materials like this, standard formats and leaders, are invariably duplicated a great deal. Copies are made from copies that are made from copies. The loss of quality that occurs from one generation to the next is inevitable. There were some typographical errors in the subtitles. The one I remember is that Hegel came out Helga. It's not unusual, I've since learned, for subtitles to run off onto the leaders. Here's another piece of head leader, another subtitle. This is a piece of tail leader. I think this is a particularly beautiful frame. And this one, too, although it's rather curt. In the fall of 1969, I came back to Los Angeles, where I had first gone five years before. The first job I had there that was connected with motion pictures was working as a stock footage researcher. This was in early 1970. I was employed by a director who was doing preliminary work on his second feature. The script called for documentary scenes of people dying violent deaths. That is to say, real people dying real deaths. The stock footage library where I did most of my research had the negative for the Pathé newsreel from beginning to end. In my search for violent deaths, what I found overwhelmingly were executions. I recall only one exception, some combat footage from the South Pacific during the Second World War. Almost all the executions were by firing squad. One of the scenes that I found was the same one that appears in Bruce Connors' film, A Movie. That execution took place in 1944. The condemned was Pietro Caruso, the superintendent of a prison in fascist Italy where political prisoners had been kept. It was one of the several scenes that I had printed. 
After two weeks, I was laid off. I handed over to my employer all the scenes that I had had printed together with my notes. Nothing ever came of the project. Ten years later, I went back to the same stock footage library to have another print made of that scene, but in the intervening decade, things there had changed. They used to make a viewing print for just a lab charge, but now they wanted a fee for each phase of their service. I thought it would help if I could speak to the people who worked in the vaults. I explained to them my love of stock footage and my need for that particular scene. They weren't familiar with the work of Bruce Connor, but they certainly had a feeling for what they dealt with. They sympathized with me, but they couldn't bend the rules. Then one of them asked me if just any old piece of stock footage would do. Rather than hurt his feelings by saying no, I said yes. He reached into a special safety container used for the disposal of nitrate film, since it's extremely flammable, and from it he pulled out a roll of negative that only a few moments earlier he had discarded as being of no further use because it had started to deteriorate, as all nitrate ultimately does. He wound down into the roll and at random pulled out a piece a few feet long and gave it to me. In this piece were two shots. This is the first. This is the second. There are swastikas on the tail and above the cabin, halfway up the side, is the name Hindenburg. This is the very dirigible that is seen in the Connor film in the throes of an apocalyptic catastrophe. I think this is camera original. The notch is to change the light in the printer. When nitrate decays, it first turns into a viscous mass, then solidifies into crystals, and then crumbles into dust. In the late spring of 1970, I got a job as the second editor on a low-budget feature called The Student Nurses. It was, in fact, a legitimate production. The executive producer was Roger Corman. It was one of the first films made by New World Productions, the company he formed after he left American International Pictures. This is not an actual scene from the film. It's some frames that were run off between takes or at the start of a magazine to make sure that the camera was threaded properly. The people in the shot that are not dressed as nurses are probably production assistants of one kind or another. I don't really know because I was never on the set. We worked in a basement on Seward Street and the lab delivered the footage to us there. We worked in two shifts. The principal editor worked during the daytime and I worked from about four in the afternoon until midnight. This is runoff also, but it closely resembles an actual shot in the film. The student nurses was booked into theaters before it went into production. We had a rough cut one week after they finished shooting. The director of photography wondered what took us so long. Roger Corman had determined from his experience that for films of the kind he specialized in, the best length was 87 minutes. The rough cut of the student nurses was 89 minutes long, and the finished film was 87. The week it played Los Angeles, it was saturation booked, and it was the top grossing film that week. For Sound Spacer, we used release prints that were no good because of errors in timing or color correction. When I had run out of things to do, I would spend my time looking at the spacer on the moviola. Most of the spacer consisted of AIP releases, like Up in the Cellar and Angel Unchained. I don't remember what film this piece came from. There were 
also some old television shows with commercials in them. I think this piece came from an episode of The Beulah Show. No uncertainty about this one. This is a piece of Academy Leader, a format that is now obsolete, that came from one of the old television shows. The numbers indicate not seconds, but feet, so they are 16 frames apart. In the student nurses, there were several opticals. For example, the optical zoom into the face of one of the student nurses that provides the transition to her altered mental state after she has drunk orange juice to which, without her knowledge, a hippie motorcyclist has added LSD. Part of my job was to be the liaison with the optical house to make the frame counts and instruct the cameraman. This is something I rescued from the trash bin there. In 1971, I began work as the editor of a low-budget feature that was known under a number of titles. The original title was Blood Virgin. A later title was The Second Coming. The film was finally, albeit briefly, released in 1975 under the title Messiah of Evil. Later on, it was re-released, again briefly, under still another title, which I'm not certain of. Not only was I the principal editor of Messiah of Evil, but I also had a bit part as an assistant in an art gallery. I was in two scenes. This is the last frame from one of the takes of the shot in which I first make my appearance. It's blurred and overexposed because the camera had almost stopped. The film was shot in technoscope, an anamorphic process invented by Technicolor. In the print, the image is compressed along the horizontal, and during projection, a special lens spreads it back out to normal. The woman in the background is the owner of the gallery. She was supposed to be deaf, dumb, and blind. In this scene, I was opposite the female lead, but because of an idiosyncrasy in her delivery, it wasn't the big moment for me that it might have been. After I gave a line, she would pause inordinately before giving hers, so it wasn't practical to do the scene as a two-shot. Instead, the director gave us each a close-up, and the pauses were eliminated in the editing. So, as I recall, I never appeared in the same shot with her. In my second scene, I was supposed to be in an alley behind the gallery where I was burning paintings by the heroine's father in order to destroy the evidence that he had been there. This piece is just a few frames run off between takes, but it's similar to my close-up for the scene, in which I'm supposed to be gazing at the paintings as they are consumed by fire. The other person in the frame is the director. This scene turned out to be unnecessary, so it didn't make it into the final cut. The laboratory we used was Technicolor. As a part of our arrangement with them, we were given an editing room at the Technicolor plant on Santa Monica Boulevard in Hollywood. At the time we were working there, Technicolor was throwing away a great quantity of file copies of films that they had processed and release printed over the years. These must have been reference copies that they had kept in order to have a record of the correct density and color for prints that they had manufactured. All day long, men would take rolls of film and mutilate them with meat cleavers and then throw them into a gigantic trash bin. 
I was able to rescue a 1,000-foot roll of trailers for the bandwagon before it was mutilated. The roll consisted of one identical copy of the trailer after another. Here's another part of it. I looked for a long time, but I couldn't find any of the rest of this film. It was directed by Edgar G. Ulmer. In another film by Ulmer called Detour, there's a remarkable moment. The main character is a fugitive from justice whose troubles began when he was hitchhiking. In the last shot of the film, he's walking along a highway at night. He speaks in an interior monologue, wondering what his life might have been if he had never accepted the fateful ride. Then, with sudden conviction, he speaks these words. But one thing I don't have to wonder about, I know someday a car will stop to pick me up that I never thumbed. At that moment, a police car overtakes him and he is arrested. He seems almost to welcome it. He has only to predict it, and the future occurs. His shifting to the future tense makes the scene jump forward, revealing as a certainty the outcome that the character's fatalism has long foreshadowed. And yet this disjunction in time, a kind of ellipsis into the future, takes place within a single continuous shot. This is the only piece of this film that I found. There's no soundtrack. There's a fade out. The shot comes at the end of a reel. This film had some very long takes in it. Takes, I think, as long as a 35 millimeter camera was capable of at that time, and for that matter, I believe, still is. During the editing of Messiah of Evil, we had occasion to use some scene missing. Scene missing is cut into a work print wherever there's a shot, such as an insert or a pickup, that will be done later on. It's meant to explain any ellipsis that occurs with a shot not being present in the cut. A peculiarity in the role of scene missing we bought was that there were a lot of irregularities and inconsistencies in the image from one frame to the next. This doesn't ordinarily occur in title art, and in this case, the flaws were probably introduced successively over time during the repeated dupings that material like this is inevitably subjected to. To me, the flaws had the effect of transforming the image from being title-like, that is to say, words just being present on the screen, into a live-action scene, a scene of this particular flat object positioned in front of the camera that had taken on a life of its own. At that time, Technicolor was still doing imbibition printing. Imbibition, or IB printing, was the dye transfer process that was the foundation of the Technicolor system. By means of filters, Technicolor would make a separation matrix from the original color negative for each of three colors, yellow, cyan, and magenta. To make a print, each matrix was immersed in a bath of the corresponding dye, which it would soak up, that is to say, imbibe. Each of the matrices was applied in turn to the print stock, each in correct registration with the others. All the photographic materials used in IB printing were monochrome, and the dyes were stable and resistant to fading, so the matrices and prints had a high degree of permanence. This is the head or tail, I don't know which, of the imbibition matrix for the magenta record. This material is beautiful to handle. It's more substantial than ordinary film. It's still pliable and limber, but in a different way. When IB release prints were ordered in large quantities, they were cheaper than other processes, and Technicolor was able to make money on the volume. But in the early 70s, Technicolor came to a critical moment. The manufacture of IB prints was labor-intensive, and labor costs were going up. 
At the same time, studios became less confident of the market for their product and so began to order prints in smaller quantities. The only way Technicolor could offer IB printing and stay competitive with other processes was to automate, but they didn't have the resources to do so. A few years after we finished working on the film, the Hollywood plant stopped making IB prints. The People's Republic of China was interested in the IB process, but they didn't want the old machines. Technicolor built new machines for them, closed the Hollywood plant, and sold the old machines for scrap. A few months after the Hollywood plant closed, a display ad appeared in the Hollywood Reporter that took the form of a memorial announcement. It read, in loving memory, I.B., born 1927, died 1975. Hollywood's own dye transfer process, whose life was unrivaled for beauty, longevity, and flexibility, we salute you. It was signed, The Friends of I.B. Here's the head of an I.B. print. Everything's in register and the soundtrack is correctly synchronized with the picture. Synchronization in 35 is to the middle of the frame. Here's another one, but there's no soundtrack. I forget where I found this piece. The chart is off-center in the frame because the camera had a silent aperture and the viewfinder was aligned for an academy aperture. When sound came in, a place had to be found for the track, and the academy aperture was the solution. The frame kept the same proportions, but it was made smaller and was shifted to one side. Here's a piece of film that to me is full of interesting incidents, none of them related to one another. And here is that figure who in some quarters is emblematic almost of film itself. She is called, most obviously because of her dress, the China Girl an odious term, but it's universal, and so it's hard to avoid. The China girl is the most familiar of the many people who perform the same function. Like her, the others are all women, and they are all anonymous. Here's one of her less well-known counterparts. Skin tones are the most important subject in films made in the industry, and skin tones are also the one subject in which the eye is most readily able to detect errors in color correction. The China Girl and her sisters are intended as examples of well-exposed skin tones, and they are used by motion picture laboratories as a guide in calibrating their equipment. Sometimes examples of standard reference colors are included in the scene as well. The usual procedure is to cut a few frames of the scene into the leader of the picture negative, and so she becomes a part of each release print. This figure's sex, her being in the margin of the film, her serving to establish and maintain a standard of correct appearance, these are aspects of a single question that deserves thought. Another example.
and yet still another. In a literal sense, these women are just as much a part of the film as those images that are intended to be presented to our view, yet their presence is invariably suppressed as being an intrusion, as being no proper part of the film. It is the people working behind the scenes, such as laboratory technicians, those people who dedicate their lives to rendering appearance perfect, who know these women best. Here is an attempt to convey something of the same information without having to rely on the human body. The panel at the upper left is meant to represent flesh. Here are some pieces of film that I think are interesting to look at.
I don't remember where I found any of these, but I remember that the last piece came from the leader for one of the reels of the Honeymoon Killers.